War. War never changes. But theories in Fallout lore do. In this series, we're going to discover the most obscene and mysterious theories that the Fallout franchise has to offer. So get your Vault Boy thumbs out and prepare to measure the nuclear mind-blowing that you're going to experience. This is the definitive Fallout Theory Iceberg. Before we dive in, you may not be familiar with iceberg theories or videos. The iceberg theory was created by the famous American writer Ernest Hemingway who coined, the deeper meaning of a story should not be evident on the surface, but should shine through implicitly. As we travel further down the iceberg, theories will be more complex. Maybe that means it's harder to believe, or it's unrealistic, or maybe like Hemingway says, it's implied rather than specifically stated. And if you're not familiar with Fallout, then have you been living under a rock? Or maybe a large mountain inside hundreds of tons of steel specifically designed to keep you from being irradiated and turned into a mutant with three arms. Fallout is the post-apocalyptic video game series first created by Interplay, who designed Fallout 1 and 2, which were isometric top-down RPGs. These games did very well at the time, and a small RPG studio named Bethesda Game Studio took notice and decided to buy up the rights and make a little game called Fallout 3. The game was a major success following its similar predecessors called Morrowind and Oblivion. The Fallout games had now become open world 3D RPGs that placed an emphasis on player choice and environment. The world of Fallout is based on the idea that nuclear energy became the de facto source of energy in the 50s and continued on into the future. The 50s cultural aesthetic never changed and that's why the world looks the way it does. Many people who play Fallout think the bombs fell in that time frame, but in fact the bombs fell in the year 2077. The Fallout world is dark, but it has a sense of humor. Todd Howard described the humor like hiding under a desk to get away from a nuke. It is mysterious and ambitious, and I have no doubt that some of the theories that you're going to hear here, you've never heard of before. I also have to put a disclaimer here that we will be talking about spoilers for all the games in the Fallout series, so be aware of that. And also that I chose not to do several of the theories on the list because they are almost pure conjecture with no real basis. Enough context, let's dive into the first tier of the iceberg that only has one theory in our list. Alt Boy's Thumb This one you may have heard before and it's become quite the wives tale over time. This is the Vault Boy, and he's a pretty prominent figure not just within the Fallout community, but also within the gaming community as a whole. He is the mascot for a major corporation within the Fallout games that created the majority of the vaults seen within the game. Vault Tech. The theory is pretty interesting and if you look it up you'll see numerous articles by multiple publishers that ran with the story several years back. The theory states that the Vault Boy isn't just giving you a cool thumbs up and a wink, letting you know that you'll be totally fine in the vault and definitely no terrible science experiments will be performed on you. But in fact, he's actually measuring a mushroom cloud from a nuclear bomb and closing his left eye to observe it. So why would you measure a mushroom cloud? Well, a story went around that the government used to recommend a person stick their thumb out. If the blast was bigger than the person's thumb, they are within the radiation zone and should evacuate. This makes total sense when you think about it and gave the Vault Boy an interesting backstory that people could surprise their friends with. Unfortunately, this little tale and theory has been debunked. Brian Fargo, one of the original creators of Fallout, actually debunked this theory on Twitter. But not only that, an article from Inverse actually proved that standing there with your thumb up, watching a nuclear bomb detonate was a good way to get yourself killed. You might as well hide in a fridge for all that'll do for you. Someone there? I can hear you. Get me out of this thing. This is because not all nukes are created equally, and they can explode with different intensities over time. The article dives further into the mathematics of it all, but I don't have time in this video to explain everything, so I'll leave a link down below if you want to check it out yourself. So I guess we'll just have to go back to believing that our sweet Vault Boy mascot is just trying to keep us safe from the horrors of the outside world, and that we should just embrace the safety of our vaults. On to tier 2 of the iceberg, and we finally dive into the water. At this point, I probably won't try to hold your hand as much. I'll start to assume you know the context of some characters and of some of the games. If not, don't worry. I'll still give you a little overview of what's going on so that you can just follow along. 
The first theory on this list, New Vegas is the Wizard of Oz retold. This is a pretty common theory and there are multiple videos that cover this theory here on YouTube entirely. I'll give you the rundown though so you can just make up your own mind of whether you believe this to be a real or just a coincidence. Basically this theory states that the game takes inspiration from The Wizard of Oz. The road to New Vegas is like the yellow brick road, everyone telling you to stay on the road or the path. You travel to Nipton, and then on to Novak, and then on to New Vegas. You get to New Vegas and you're met by the elusive Mr. House, aka the man behind the curtain or screen, aka the Wizard of Oz. A normal or fragile man hidden behind a grand illusion that makes you seem like he is larger than life itself. These representations are pretty obvious and most people connect these dots pretty early on, but it's not the main game that really cements this theory into people's mind. It's a DLC that makes you really wonder. Old World Blues takes you to the Big MT or the Big Mountain. It's full of chaos, robots, lobotomists, and crazy inventions. After you're abducted and brought to this place, you find yourself trying to return home. This is similar to Dorothy's story in The Wizard of Oz. To return back to the Mojave, you have to retrieve parts of your body that were stolen from you and replaced with synthetic machine parts. Your heart, aka the Tin Man, your brain, aka the Scarecrow, and then your spine, aka your sense of courage and the cowardly lion. They seem pretty right on the nose, and I personally believe that they did take some reference from the classical story. One last instance that leads to the belief of this story is that one of the doctors in the Big MT, Dr. Mobius, actually references the Wizard of Oz in his dialogue, but it's a bit weird and it's a mixed up kind of version of the story. The last theory in this tier is probably the most talked about theory in all of Fallout. Well, at least one of the most. The sole survivor from Fallout 4 is a synth. Now, there is a lot to this theory and people are still finding things that may or may not lead to confirming it. But, because there's so much to this theory, I can't dive into everything as we have a lot to go over in the iceberg. But I'll give you the bullet points and the more obvious things that have led to this theory actually being created. The theory began to gain traction when the Far Harbor DLC came out. A synth named Dima is speaking to the sole survivor and asks them what their earliest memory is. To which they respond, it's the day the bombs fell, which is the first day you actually begin to play in Fallout 4. This is obviously a strange response considering the sole survivor should have years of memories before this actual event occurs. They allegedly grew up in a normal world and had a normal life. The default male character even references the war and his grandpa in the opening sequence. Why is it that they can't remember anything before the bombs? Some theorize that cryosleep could affect the human brain and our memories, others that the memory was placed inside their brain by the Institute. Thema goes on to explain that the large gaps in memory are common among other synths with memories that have been implanted into them. So did the Institute implant the sole survivor with memories of a person that they never were? Similar to Nick Valentine who shares memories with a pre-war detective? The next piece of strong evidence is that while we're exploring the Institute, we can find a computer entry that talks about the Institute experimenting with VATS and then placing it inside of synths, giving them the innate ability to use VATS without a pit boy. The crazy thing is, the sole survivor can use VATS on the rad roaches in the vault before ever picking up the pit boy at the entrance of the vault. Is this just an oversight on Bethesda's part, or is it something more? Speaking of the vault though, why is it that the Soul Survivor is the Soul Survivor? Why or how is it possible that they are the only ones to survive the cryo chambers while the others failed? It seems almost convenient that they're the only ones to survive and that their child is the director of the Institute. Later on, Father or Sean explains that it is his will to keep us on ice and that he was protecting us and that he was the one who ultimately released us as an experiment. This is a strange thought because you can read on a terminal near the cryopods that the life support of the pods failed and this is why everyone died. So maybe it was all father's will and maybe the sole survivor is an experiment. But the big question is, what kind of experiment? Well that does it for the top two tiers and we are moving into the deeper waters of the iceberg. There's a ton to go through here so I'm going to run through these fairly quickly and just give a brief of my own thoughts. 
If you guys hear a theory here that you find super interesting or you want to know more about it, then leave it in the comments and maybe I'll make some videos on those theories specifically. So let's jump into the third tier that has three theories within it. The first is that James can't die in Tranquility Lane. It seems really strange that James, the protagonist's father in Fallout 3, wasn't subjected to the same horrors as his counterparts in the simulation of Tranquility Lane. And why is that? There's a dozen reasons one can imagine, in reality it isn't stated why. Though it also isn't a plot hole either, there are a lot of reasons why this could be. My first thought is because you weren't meant to be there, or you're not properly logged onto the systems or records, or whatever, so it treats James and the Vault Wanderer differently. The second is, the loungers James and the Lone Wanderer are in were likely isolated because they were external intrusions on the network because they were added centuries after the simulation started and weren't approved by vault Tech or Braun. The third was because neither James nor the Lone Wanderer were shot and killed by the Chinese invaders, which was how the failsafe worked. Once the failsafe is activated, you die in the sim, you die in real life. For the fourth, the loungers were just poorly designed, hence why the old lady was aware of what was actually happening around her. There's not much left to say on this one, but just remember that you don't want to be stuck in old Tranquility Lane. You might be spending a lot of time there, for a long time. The next theory is the Bible Vault Numbers. This one is super interesting and holds a lot of merit for me personally. The theory states that the vault numbers are correlated to Bible references specifically from Psalms. I'll give you a few examples, but there are many more, and I encourage you guys to go check them out yourself and see if you can make a connection between the vault and the Bible as well. Vault 101 is led by the Overseer at the start of Fallout 3. The Overseer is a dictator with zero tolerance for people that go against his rules and are different. Now let's look at some of the chosen excerpts from Psalms 101. Quote, I will walk in my house with blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate, they will not cling to me. Men of perverse heart shall be far from me. Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I put to silence. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. End quote. Sounds like someone that believes their word is law and no one can actually defy these rules. Another example would be Vault 106, which was pumped full of psychoactive drugs that made the inhabitants crazy and lose themselves. Psalm 106 talks about people forgetting their faith in God and being destroyed for it. And my favorite, Vault 69 was filled with 999 women and one man. The Psalm 69 exer says, quote, For the waters have come up to my neck, I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. So a person who's worn out and outnumbered. Seems pretty relevant in my opinion. So these are pretty cool. And like I said, there's a lot more. So go check them out and see what you can find. Christine is Veronica's lost love. This one seems less like a theory and more just like it's not stated explicitly. Veronica is a Brotherhood of Steel member and so is Christine. They're both attracted to women exclusively. Christine says that Father Elijah forced her and her partner apart while Veronica states love wasn't enough. Is this because Christine decided to leave the Brotherhood because of Elijah, whereas Veronica wanted to stay? There isn't like a ton of evidence to suggest they're connected beyond both of them being members and both of them being connected to Elijah, but that's already a massive connection. Like I said, it is a theory because it's not confirmed, but for me it seems heavily implied and kind of obvious. I wish we could have brought back Christine from the Sierra Madre and reunited her with Veronica or something. That just would have been amazing. But for now, I guess we'll always just have to wonder what was or what could have been. Moving on to the next tier, and our first theory from that tier, the Wanamingo's Origins. So what is a Wanamingo? Well, they're alien looking creatures from Fallout 2 that seemingly come out of nowhere and have zero background. And when the player character first encounters them, they are labeled as aliens. But as you enter their underground burrow, their name actually changes to the Wanamingo as the character is assumed to have realized they're not actually aliens. From my research, I learned that they hatch eggs and they have a large queen and they also have a hive mind mindset. They're also bipedal creatures that kind of look like the xenomorphs from Alien. 
Like I said, they have no specific canonical background in the games or any references about their past. But the Fallout Bible, which is considered by most non-canon, does state that they are FEV experiments created by either the Enclave or the Master potentially. Regardless, their origin will remain a mystery unless Bethesda includes them in a future title. Sam caused the Great War. This one has gained a lot of traction because of the YouTuber Juicehead, who I'm sure you guys already know. He's awesome and he made a video about Pam actually orchestrating the bombs being launched. He bases his theory on the fact that Bethesda themselves said the theory is on Reddit and Todd Howard confirming that there is a secret on a terminal that no one had been able to find yet. If you guys want a detailed breakdown of this theory specifically, I would go check out his videos on this specific topic. The theory basically states that Pam, who basically predicts outcomes on things by using insane factors, was being used by the US government to determine when the Great War would have been coming and help the government preempt it. Pam says herself that her outcomes can have a extremely high margin of error due to humans being unpredictable organisms. This then leads to Pam feeding the US government false data of the Chinese government sending nukes first, which then leads to the US sending nukes after, and then them actually starting the Great War. Now, like I said, this is a great video, and he does dive into more details of how this could happen, but while researching the theory, I came across a lot of points that kind of debunk it as well. We know that in canon, California had no time to respond because they were the first ones hit with the nukes. So why isn't it that if Pam had doctored the data, the US government couldn't have warned California before the nukes actually hit them? They would have had enough times because the nukes weren't actually on the way yet. Black Mountain also states that the Chinese satellites were going ballistic right before the nukes had launched and made no mention of the US sending nukes. They wouldn't have reported any change if the US had fired first. We also know that the Enclave is on the oil rig at the time, and they would have also seen the nukes firsthand, and the president was also on the oil rig as well. He states that China actually fired first, but then again that could actually be propaganda, who knows. Regardless, this is one of the most interesting theories in Fallout lore, and just when everyone thought it was solved, we're right back to debating. <laughs> Anyways, I spent far too much time in that theory, so I'm gonna bust out these next ones pretty quickly, just giving you the rundown. And yes, I know I said that before, but come on, we're having fun here! Multiple Lanius. This theory suggests that there are multiple Legate Laniuses running around, because having only one general with such a large force would be almost impossible for any army. This theory is based in the fact that he seemingly cannot be killed and is a monstrosity that all men in the Legion fear. You wouldn't want to lose such a prominent figure, so if he did in fact perish, you would cover it up and place the helmet on the next biggest dude. There's no real basis for this theory beyond those points, but it's definitely interesting to think about Legate Lanius being dead several times over and someone then taking up the helmet for themselves. I wouldn't put it past Kaisar to also think of this. Interesting to think about. Boone's Sniper Nest so there's a sniper's nest that overlooks cottonwood cover. There isn't much there besides some mugs and a lockbox that contains a mink conditioned sniper rifle from the Gobi campaign. This place is actually theorized to be the place that Boone took the shot and put his wife to rest. Some speculate that this seems strange that Boone would track the slavers as far as he did, drag all those materials up to the spot and create a nest just to shoot his wife. Seems odd and far-fetched, as he could have just taken the shot on like a hill or across a river, who knows where, he's a good shot. But there is some validity to this one. There is a note that can be found at Camp McCarran on Ronald Curtis's desk that informs the reader of the location of this exact nest. So maybe Boone knew the location of this nest beforehand and he used it to actually take the shot, leaving the mint condition sniper behind so that he no longer had to use it or think about it. The pint-sized slasher is real. The pint-sized slasher was a pre-war 21st century child serial killer who wore a sinister clown mask. And when I say child serial killer, I don't mean he killed children. He is a child. He also wore a white striped shirt with jeans and used a large chef knife as his signature killing tool. The player is able to pose as this killer in the Tranquility Lane quest, activated by entering Vault 112 with the ability to kill all residents of the small cul-de-sac. It was apparently a myth that was used to scare children that misbehave. Or was it? 
If you enter room 1K in the Homestead Motel and Point Lookout DLC in Fallout 3, you will find a peculiar mask. The Pint Size Slasher's mask, clearly meaning he's real. Kidding, kidding. In a terminal found in the Parsons Asylum in Fallout 4, it talks about a homicidal 10-year-old, which seems pretty bleak. Seems even weirder that there is a myth in DC that involved a homicidal child that would go around killing people in a Halloween mask. So maybe Bobby's identity and murderers were sensationalized by the media and parents ran with the story across the East Coast to their kids. Now on the other end of the spectrum, this could have definitely happened before the slasher's time since it says Bobby Smith is a local in Boston. But maybe if Jack was preoccupied with his father Lorenzo during the time, the murderer could have escaped and then fled to DC. But I guess we'll never know. Just keep one eye open and looking about halfway towards the ground, just in case. <laughs> We've made it to the next tier and things start to get a little funky, but nothing that seems totally tinfoil hat yet. Don't worry, I'll let you know when to throw one on. First theory is that the Zaydens are the ones who actually nuked the Earth. This one is hard to really believe because it goes against the entire point of Fallout. That humanity effectively destroyed itself because of its own destructive nature. There is no actual in-canon lore to suggest they did this anyways. But where this theory ultimately stems from is some cut content from the Mothership Zeta DLC in Fallout 3. The cut content suggested that the Zaydens abducted a general and forced him to give them the launch codes to the nukes. Like I said, it never made it into the actual cut of the game, but it is interesting to note that Bethesda was considering the possibility. I'm not saying they were planning on making the Zaydens the cause of the Great War, but maybe they were trying to show that they had some sort of influence on it. Regardless, the only other possibility that could confirm this theory is that when the mothership arrived and launched several smaller ships, these could then be picked up on US military radar and that it maybe led to the US believing it was China launching their nukes. Something to think about. The last theory in this tier is the true origins of Jet. This one is probably more likely explained by Bethesda retconning a few things from the previous games, but let's look into it anyways. In Fallout 2, a man named Myron is the creator of Jet, a drug that is used in the Fallout universe. Later on, after Bethesda bought the rights to the series, they introduced Jet on the East Coast in Fallout 3 and in Fallout 4. But in Fallout 4, there's several pre-war terminal entries talking about Jet. For example, one terminal in the vault Tech office building had an entry from an employee who found out that Jet was being shipped to some of the vaults. So how could Myron claim to have made Jet if it was already being made before the bombs ever fell? So either A, Myron recreated Jet by figuring out a remarkably similar formula, or B, he lied and just wanted people to believe he was the one who created it, but instead had the pre-war formula all along. I like to believe Myron created a drug from Brahmin shit, as we know, and just figured screw it, I'll just call it Jet. Seems pretty Fallout appropriate. Or maybe it was just a Bethesda employee that didn't know the true origins of Jet when writing in the terminal log. It's not as fun to think about, but Occam's Razor can be a bitch, sometimes. Now we're getting on to the last three tiers. There are absolutely loads of theories in these tiers, and they get super weird. Some of the theories have such a small basis for which they are created that I would mostly be speculating on the theory's behalf if I wanted to dive more into them. So on that note, I'll just tell you about the theory, where it comes from, and my own personal thoughts instead of making some wild claims and accusations. I am no Fallout master by any means, and I never claim to be. I could definitely be wrong on some of these theories' origins or facts because they're so subtle and vague, but I tried to do the best research I could for you guys, so just forgive me if that's the case. Let's move on to the next tier, and the first theory, Boone, is in Fallout Tactics. <laughs> I bet my boss will give me all the promotion and props I need after I bring him some Brotherhood slaves. Let's see what you trained monkeys can show little old Horace. This one is dumb and probably shouldn't be on the list. I tried to find any semblance of anything and the only thing I could find is this clip I just played for you. The voice actor for Boone, Jason Marzen, also plays this character in Fallout Tactics. So no, this isn't Boone. Fun fact, he also voices Myron from Fallout 2, who we just talked about. Ultra fun fact, he also voices Goofy's son Max Goof in the Goofy movie. So yeah, that's pretty rad. The mysterious stranger is an eldritch god. 
This mostly stems from an interesting description in the Fallout 3 game guide that describes the mysterious stranger as an odd eldritch entity, which is really weird and makes no sense being in the game guide unless they're just using it as a metaphor. Really strange. From what I could find about the theory is that the mysterious stranger is a god because he appears during death to help you defeat your opponent. If you know a bit about Fallout lore, you know there are tons of references and comparisons to Lovecraftian lore. This includes the Dunwich Building and the Burrows and several others. The Mysterious Stranger has been theorized for as long as he has existed and there are loads of videos based solely on this character. As far as an eldritch entity goes, I don't know about that one. It is in the official game guide though, so maybe it is true. Bet no one expected that. <laughs> Oh, and also the guide calls him Farmer, and no, that's not his occupation, but actually his name. So maybe this is Farmer, and he's a god. Cool. Fallout 76 is a simulation. This one is really cool and something that I could definitely get on board with. I'm not a huge fan of 76, but I have no issues with others playing the game. I myself haven't gone through the story, but I'm definitely interested in some of the lore that they've created. Regardless, I have played a little through the story, and as I understand it, the premise of the Vault Dwellers in 76 is to leave the vault and rebuild the world, or at least the Appalachian Waste. There's no concrete proof to suggest this is a simulation, but some people are positive that the game will be referenced in Fallout 5 as a simulation, and that it was made to train individuals that leave the vaults on how to survive and rebuild in their environments. The rebuild objectives, the random events and occurrences that happen over and over again, the interaction with the other vault dwellers seemingly being positive and goofy, almost like they're taking things lightly and aren't in complete danger of dying at every moment. The addition of new NPCs showing up out of nowhere to progress a storyline. Is this a simulation made at the Vault Tech College for students to interact with? But while there are definitely some points to be made for the confirmation of the theory, there are a whole host against it as well. Like far more. Like, way more that I won't even list them all. <laughs> How would vault Tech know about all the monsters that actually exist in Fallout canon, like the Mirelarks, Ghouls, etc.? How would they know that bottle caps would become the currency? How does Shannon Rivers, aka the Mistress of Mystery, have pre-war emails from Kent the Ghoul in Good Neighbor? How would it even be possible to simulate all that? It just doesn't click. Unless... What if the simulation is occurring during the present of the Fallout universe, similar to Tranquility Lane? What if it's a bunch of vault residents stuck in a simulation that pulls references from the real world through an AI or something like that? But then again, maybe not. See how fun it is to theorize? But I do wonder why the events from Fallout 6 are never mentioned in Fallout 3 and 4. You would think that all these people rebuilding the Appalachian Mountains would get noticed, right? Hmm... Nobark Noonan is the Chosen One. So if you didn't know, the Chosen One is the title of the player character from Fallout 2. So essentially, the character that you choose to play as, and this theory suggests that Nobark from Novak is actually that character. Yeah, I'm not kidding. We'll just see about that. You come any closer and I'm liable to stick you with my sticking knife. Old stick is feeling mighty ornery this day. On the New Vegas map, you'll find a wrecked vehicle in a location marked Wrecked Highwaymen. This seems to be a reference to the car you can repair and drive around in Fallout 2. The interesting part about this car is that it's located right outside of Novak. See where I'm going here? We know that Fallout New Vegas takes place 40 years after the events of Fallout 2. This would put Nobark at the right age for how old the Chosen One would be. Obviously that would depend on how old the players made the Chosen One but he'd probably be somewhere in the ballpark in the range of 60 to 70. Now this gets a little more wild when you realize that you can find a gun called That Gun in Novak that looks almost identical to the one the Chosen One uses in Fallout 2. Spooky, right? So what about Nobark? Well, if you don't know Nobark, then you don't know what he's like. He's a, uh, interesting guy. He claims to have been stung multiple times in the head by rad scorpions, which is why he doesn't remember much from his past life. I'm inclined to believe him. Well, says no bark, we got a chupacabra with an automatic weapon. He also references some eerily similar things that occurred in Fallout 2. He says he learned magic from a talking cave rat. The Chosen One talks to a rat in Fallout 2. 
He says that Benny was captured by aliens because of his checkered suit and that aliens can't see very well. This could be a reference to the Wanamingos in Fallout 2 that we already talked about that have no eyes or terrible vision and only can see in checkers. He's also loaded. Every time you play him in Caravan, he has a thousand chips. Coincidence? I think not. The Vault 11 Survivor. I don't want to dive too deep into the actual Vault 11 experiment, but I'll give you the background on the survivor from the vault on the wiki, so you know a bit of what I'm talking about. After the conclusion of Vault 11's Civil War, only five people were left alive. The survivors refused to continue the experiment, expecting to be killed. Instead, the vault door opened, and they were informed that they had done the American thing, not sacrificing their peers. Traumatized by this information, they either killed themselves or were killed by one another with the exception of one individual. A gun dropped to the ground can be heard, followed by the last individual sighing deeply and walking away. If you guys want to know more about Vault 11, look it up. I think it's one of the most interesting vaults to date, but regardless, who is the survivor and where did they go? Lots of people theorize it could be Nobark since the vault is very close to Novak and Nobark references Kami ghosts. But this theory falls apart quickly when you realize that the vault has been abandoned since 2095 and the courier accesses it in 2281. So for 86 years the vault has been closed. Meaning for that the Vault 11 survivor to still be alive they would have to be a ghoul or some other type of mutant. Maybe they're still out there though. Wandering the wastes as a ghoul. Or a super mutant who forgot who they were. Maybe that's for the best. Now we're moving on to the last two tiers, and this is where I suggest you put your tinfoil hats, or at least your spacesuits for the great beyond, because things are gonna get really wacky from here on out. The Cat Vault. This one is really strange and kind of funny that it made it on the list. It was hard to find anything about it, but I finally stumbled across what I believe the iceberg is referencing. Long before Fallout 4 came out, a leak came out about the game and some of the things that would be in it. For what it's worth, the leak was half correct, but some of the rest of the stuff was either made up or never made it into the game. And this is where the cat vault comes in. The leak references a vault full of cats in Fallout 4, and I think people ingrained it into their brains as just being a thing after reading these leaks and waiting for the game. I found multiple people on Reddit asking if the cat vault was real or that they had heard of such a thing in the past games. I think this is kind of like the Mandela effect, and people are just misremembering past game quotes. Mr. House tells the courier that cats have actually gone extinct, which by the way is not true as we can see them from Fallout 4. This could be one of those references where people kind of put that into their minds and in the back of their minds, and it comes out differently when they think about it. Anyways, really crazy one here. It doesn't really have any merits to exist, and I probably should have left it off the list, but there were some interesting parts about it. So there you go. Mikey Frazier founded the White Glove Society. This one comes out of left field and doesn't have much meaty content to cut into, but it appears that the theory stems from the fact that Mike Frazier, a character in Fallout 2, that sells meat and iguana bits with his father is the founder of the White Glove Society. If you don't know, the White Gloves who stay in the Ultralux on the Strip are actually cannibals and were cannibals back in their tribal days. They've retained this little secret and still practice to this day. The only reason I could find that people may suggest that he's the founder of the tribe is because of the appearance right here. He seems to be sporting a very fancy and classy tux while selling his iguana bits. Maybe it's coincidental and maybe not. He doesn't say much to the Chosen One and has very few lines of dialogue and all of the townspeople say that he keeps to himself. Selling meat, wearing fancy clothes, and a weird behavior. Where have I seen that before? That's an interesting thought though. So be it. But we are all cannibals here. Or the Vault 11 scientists actually the variable. This theory suggests that the scientists in Vault 111, the ones who weren't placed in the cryopods, were actually the ones being experimented on, to see how they would react when Vault Tech never sends an all-clear signal and they're left wondering what to do. But maybe they never received an all-clear signal because it was never actually all-clear. Regardless, the vault was running fairly well and the cryopods seemed to be working relatively fine. That is, until Cornflakes Kellogg rolled in and killed everyone. 
I could show you the terminals in Vault 111 talking about why they aren't getting the all clear and so on and so forth, but you guys probably understand that part already. I think the meat and potatoes here is that some people think that maybe Vault Tech had possibly two experiments going on. The scientists who were stuck in a vault with no way out and if people were actually able to survive in cryo chambers. But why then have Vault 13? Vault 13's entire premise was to keep the vault door closed forever to see if the inhabitants could survive forever underground, completely isolated and alone by themselves. Is that not the same experiment being theorized for Vault 111? I think the more interesting theory of 111 is the one that actually leads us into our next theory. Were the vaults intended to prep people for space travel? This one actually has some substance to it, and not only that, this theory actually received some validity to it very recently. Tim Kaine, one of the original creators of the Fallout series, revealed on his YouTube channel that the vaults initially had a much grander purpose. They were initially meant to send people to space, he said, hoping they would find a new planet to live on. I'll leave a link to the video below if you guys want to check it out. It was interesting to hear from the creator of Fallout that the initial purpose of the vaults was made to test space travel and surviving on a foreign planet. Kane explained that getting the vault dwellers to space would be a multi-generational plan because they needed to figure out how to grow plants really well in an enclosed environment and ensure that the water being used was safe to consume. Does this really confirm the theory though? No, because they shifted gears with vaults later on in the design process. But maybe they kept this idea in the back of their minds, and so did Bethesda later on in the future. You can obviously see some designs of experiments being incorporated into a space migration mission. Vault 111 and the cryopod shows that the vault tech was testing if it was possible to place people into pods and see how long they could last. The Gex being created to terraform a wasteland or even a barren planet. Vault 13 and the long term effects of isolation. Vault 81 focused on creating and curing a multitude of illnesses that could help with foreign pathogens on a new planet. I mean, if you look at almost every single vault, you can probably tie it into the idea of space travel. But like I said, with Tim Kaine seemingly confirming the purpose of the vaults were created with this idea in mind, then you can almost be sure that vault Tech had this premise somewhat in mind while creating the vaults. Maybe they scrapped the idea, or maybe it all went to plan and they left Earth into the stars. On to the last tier, and if you guys have made it this far, I really appreciate it. I hope you've learned something new about Fallout, or you were at least entertained. If you did, please leave a like and consider subscribing for more Fallout and RPG content. With that out of the way, let's head into the final tier and the theories that truly make your head spin. Kale Wachene Conserva O. You understand me, don't you? Don't you? Kale Wachene Conserva O. This is a phrase that Joshua Graham speaks to Salt Upon Wounds after defeating the White Legs in tribal combat. He asks Salt Upon Wounds if he understands, and the whole thing seems pretty vague, and it's probably meant to be vague. But what does it mean? Well, that's the question loads of Fallout fans on Reddit and No Mutants Allowed have tried to solve. From what I understand, Dead Horse's language is a combination of English, German, and Navajo. Sorrows is a combination of English and Spanish, and the White Legs is a combination of English, Spanish, and Shoshone. Combining all these languages would probably give you a good idea of what it might mean, but you would probably still be mostly guessing. The most prevailing theory is that it means, as God is my witness, Kale Wacha, none of you will be spared, Nai Conserva O, which seems pretty on brand for Joshua himself. This comes from a No Mutants Allowed thread that explored the line's meaning and several dedicated fans breaking it down. I'll leave a link to the thread if you want to see how they came to the conclusion and maybe start forming your own. But like I said, this language is basically gobbledygook, so understanding it is almost an impossible task. The one thing that isn't a theory in all of this though, is that Joshua Graham is a badass, and that's just facts. The New Vegas Space Program This one is hard to find much on, but I believe the general premise is that House from New Vegas created a space program to try and get people off of Earth. This is a similar theory to that of the vaults being made for space travel. Basically, House makes an offhand comment in his dialogue about heading the space exploration program, and we know that he had three fully stocked and ready to launch rockets in the Mojave. With all that money pouring in, give me 20 years and I'll reignite the high technology development sectors. 50 years and I'll have people in orbit. 
100 years, and my colony ships will be heading for the stars to search for planets unpolluted by the wrath and folly of a bygone generation. Hal saying that he wants to take people to space is more about his hubris and ego, in my opinion. His plans obviously changed, and now he's looking to control New Vegas in itself after seeing that humanity is on the rise yet again. Not much else to dive into here as we already discussed space travel, so I won't bore you with more of it, but just so you know, the house always wins. Poseidon 18F Chalk Writings Poseidon Energy was the leading petroleum supplier in the Fallout universe pre-boom. Poseidon the company itself could have an entire several hours long video made on them, but we're just going to focus on a specific plant called 18F. While exploring this plant, you'll run into a weird scene. You find Cuddy's throne. On top of the throne, you see the word OK and the letter X written multiple times. Seems like nothing at first until you notice the word glory. Is Cuddy's gang involved with the railroad in any way? Seems like Cuddy, the bandit leader, might be a runaway mind wipe synth because synths are attacking the plant, maybe trying to recapture her? The chalk writing could be some form of railroad communication between Cuddy and themselves, or maybe it's just an old railroad safe house. It is pretty strange though, and if you notice the chalkboard, you can see six X's with three of them crossed out and more question marks and the words OK. Honestly, I couldn't find much on this and it seems like people aren't really theorizing too heavily about it, so if you want to make your mark on the Fallout world, then this might be your chance to figure out a lore secret. I'm not one to guesstimate what it could all mean, but it also seems like a code or a list? Hard to say. Fallout is a cosmic horror series, or Lovecraftian. This one goes deep, and I mean really deep. I already brought it up in earlier theories, but let's see some examples of how Fallout may actually exist in the Lovecraftian horror world. The first is the Pikmin Gallery in Fallout 4, which is based on a Lovecraft story called Pikmin's Model. The story revolves around a painter named Richard Pinkman who makes brilliant but horrifying paintings and also lives in Boston. Eerie, I know. After being expelled from his art organization, he goes missing and two of his friends head to his gallery to try and locate him. Basically, his friends discover he has paintings full of horrifying monsters and that these monsters eventually turn out to be real, not just figments of Pikmin's imagination. Another one is the Cabot House. This one is all over the Lovecraftian place with the family creating a serum that keeps them from aging and their father finding an ancient helmet that he can't get off that gives him powers. And let's not forget everyone's favorites, the Dunwich Building and Borers, which are obvious references to Lovecraft's novella, The Dunwich Horror, which features an otherworldly, all-knowing, and all-seeing entity that can grant knowledge to those that seek it, which obviously ends bad for them in the long run. Where have I heard that before? So yeah, there are clear references to Lovecraft horror in the game, but how does that make it a cosmic horror? Well, I already told you. All the examples I gave actually have people with weird abilities and powers happening in the Fallout universe. Some, like I said before, even believe the mysterious stranger to be a Lovecraft god himself. I wish I could go further into this one because it's really interesting, but you guys get the gist. Like I said before, if there is a theory you want me to wrap my tentacles around, then leave it in the comments and I'll jump to it. It's almost like you guys are eldritch beings beyond my grasp that give me knowledge. Weird. Dogmeat is the true Fallout protagonist. <sighs> this one being the penultimate theory will either leave you feeling great because you love fluffy good boys or like you wasted your life hearing it. The theory basically derives from Dogmeat being present in every Fallout in the mainline series. That means one, two, three, and four. How is it that every dog in every game from these locations that are so disconnected have a dog named the same thing? Does every person in this damn universe just call their dogs dog meat? What am I missing here? Let's be real though for a second. We all know that this is because they are all named after each other because of the creators of each game. But I mean canonically, it really does mean that there is a dog meat companion dog in each of these timelines and locations. I love some of the goofy theories surrounding this one though. Some claiming that dog meat is the reincarnation of the protagonist from each different game, like some sort of four-legged avatar. Or maybe that he's an eldritch god, like we spoke about before, that can shapeshift into reality at any point he chooses. 
Maybe the name Dogme is a popular one in the post-apocalyptic times, and you can find it in your latest issue of the Wasteland Survival Guide. Or maybe Dogme is the real hero of the Fallout universe, and we're just the side characters along for the ride. Regardless, we can all agree on one thing. They're definitely a good boy. On to the last theory of the video, and really the theory that I think every Fallout fan has wondered. There are supposed to be two more theories, but I just combined them because they really mean the same thing. A mystery that has perplexed us fans for a very long time. Who or what is the mysterious stranger? Now this has been talked about to death on YouTube and forums. There are so many theories surrounding this one theory that I could probably spend four hours talking about it and never fully cover the entire thing. So it's almost a disservice to speak about it, but I'll try my best to break down the main theories and give you guys a good idea of the prevailing hopes for who this stranger could be. What are some of the facts that we know about the stranger? The first is that he can appear to be male or female depending on your character when he shows up. Nick Valentine also has an entire case file on the stranger, but everything seems to be conjecture and things we already know about. Confirmed sightings in the Commonwealth, Capital Wasteland, the NCR, and Shady Sands. But we also know that he makes an appearance in New Vegas as well. Nick theorizes that he may be using stealth tech to appear and disappear at will. The clothing he has been seen in is a fedora and a large overcoat. No calling cards left behind and his sightings span decades, meaning that if he is a human, how could he have survived for so long? We already talked about the Eldritch thing earlier, but Nick offers some good suggestions. He could be a ghoul with minimal scarring, meaning that he could live for a very long time. It could be multiple people that take up the mantle when one dies, or maybe a synth that has been working for the Institute for a long time. Though, no files can be found in the Institute that warrant an observation as such. The only other semblance of hope and even a shred of any basis for who this could be is the theory that the lonesome drifter in Fallout New Vegas actually admits that the mysterious stranger is his father. When asked about his father, the lonesome drifter will say, Ma said he was a mysterious feller, even when he was with her, like he was a stranger at times. Also adding to the implication that he's a mysterious stranger's son is that his name is the lonesome drifter, a name that's pretty similar to the mysterious stranger. It's not exactly concrete information, but it seems better than most of what we have. It doesn't really help though because we don't know the Lonesome Drifter's name or even who his father could be. He doesn't even know. But the last and best theory in my opinion is the one that I think holds a lot of weight for who this person could be. A Redditor named Albert Cole suggests that the mysterious stranger is a man named Mark. The short version of his proposal is that the mysterious stranger is Mark, one of the four people that went down into the Mariposa military base along with Harold and the guy who would go on to become the master. Four people went in, one of them died in the base, Harold and the master both went on to become powerful mutants and important figures in Fallout lore, Mark just disappeared. He further proposes that they form a triad with Harold as the good speech-based resolution, the Master has evil combat-based resolution, leaving the Mysterious Stranger as a neutral stealth-based resolution. The original Fallout games had both of those axes as intentional, stressed options, so that idea does make a lot of sense. It's an intriguing concept and it makes sense for why the Mysterious Stranger is so powerful and immortal. Whoever he is though, we'll probably never find out. Why? Because if we knew who he was, he would neither be mysterious nor a stranger to us anymore. That's his entire presence, and that is the way that things should be. Sometimes letting things be the way they are is for the best, especially if you have a guardian angel that saves you from certain death by appearing out of the ether and obliterating whatever enemy you face in a single shot. So powerful that they have crushed hundreds, if not thousands of lives over the span of decades and never once coming close to being discovered. Maybe if you got too close to the truth too close to the face of death, it would decide to turn to you, and you might get your wish, but you wouldn't live to tell the tale. So that's it. That's all I've got for now. Now this isn't all the secrets and wonders in the Fallout universe, this is just the iceberg of the most fascinating theories surrounding the game. It took me quite a while to research and write up the script for the video, so if you made it this far, then thank you. 
from the bottom of my heart. Fallout holds a special place in my heart, and doing this is really deep in my relationship with the games and this awesome world. If you want to see more videos like this, then please leave a like and subscribe. It helps me know how to better foster a community of like-minded people like myself. Bethesda games and RPGs in general are what drive me to continue on in this crazy gaming community. So if you're like me, then stick around because you can bet that I'll be making more videos similar to this one. War. War never changes. And neither will the fans of Fallout as we search for the new mysterious and look forward to each next project in this franchise. I love all you guys. Have a great week. I'll catch you later.